my name is Tiffany Rock, and welcome to the Insecure Cure. This is a show that is dedicated to teach you how to stop doubting yourself and start truly believing in yourself. On this show, we will have a series of experts, and the topics will range from parenting to body image to money, success, love, and relationships. But the number one goal is to support you in deleting all of your self-doubt replacing your limiting beliefs and creating the life that you truly want. On today's episode, I am so excited to interview Lisa Nichols. She is one of the world's most sought after motivational speakers. In her personal life, she's actually gone from broke to the head of a multi-million dollar enterprise. She's a best-selling author and she's the founder and CEO of Motivating the Masses. Her company, helps you to step into your life with limitless potential, whether it's in your business life or your personal life. She is the best-selling author of six books. Her latest book is titled Abundance Now. She has been featured on a myriad of shows, Oprah Winfrey, CNN, Steve Harvey, Larry King Live, Fox News. That's just to name a few of the shows that have been honored to have her speaking and sharing her beautiful message. And now, Without further ado, we are going to welcome Lisa Nichols to The Insecure Cure. Okay, you guys, so she is here. I am so excited. Welcome me, Lisa Nichols to the show. She is like my guru. She's so motivating. And I, you heard in the intro that she's like all of that. So thank you so much for being here, Lisa. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I. I love listening to you. I love, I, I watch some of your videos and I'm grateful to be here. Thank you for allowing me to pour into you and yeah. to help be a small part of the magnificence that you are. Well, first of all, so you know this show, The Insecure Cure, is about learning how to delete self-doubt, okay? Self-doubt plays a big role in whether we're gonna reach our success levels, step into mm -hmm. our greatness. It's always there, swarming around. Yeah trying to keep us from our greatness, right? And yes. the second thing we do is we replace limiting beliefs. So, I mean, you've had experience with that. That's, I've, I've watched all your videos. I've listened to, I've actually joined your program. But replacing the limiting beliefs really makes a big difference on having breakthrough moments and starting to create the life that you want. So, um, you also said that you went from broke to millionaire. So can you let people know a little bit like how that how that happened? Because there's a lot of broke folks out there that want to know how to get going. So first of all, I um someone else wrote that. It's true, but I, I, I wouldn't have wrote that. I would have <laughs> so, uh, I would have said something more like I went from broke to not broke anymore. Strongly, strongly, powerfully, not so. Um, but yeah, I, I'm the CEO of a multi-million dollar business that I started in a walk-in closet in my apartment. Mm -hmm. My son was five years old and we had only gotten off government assistance two years prior. Wow. And um, so uh, going from, I, I, I say there's a movie, well, I've been told there's a movie that's gonna come out sometime in the future called From Welfare to Wall Street, and it'll be yeah. the story of my life. Oh my God. Um, and, and I always tell people, don't worry about what I did when I became a millionaire. Don't worry about what I did when I became a millionaire. Ask me what I did to become yes. a millionaire. Yes. You know, when people ask me, what do I do now? I'm like, that's, a, that's not the question you want to know. You want to know what, I, what was I doing 10 years ago. Right. Right. And so uh, I'm going to, if I can give you, I'm going to give you a couple of uh, high points that I did. I did a lot of small detail things. Um, but I did a lot of high points and, and you have to know, you know, you know, um, from, uh, following my work that I'm a coach. Mm -hmm. I love coaching more than anything. Mm -hmm. Um, um, and I like long-term coaching. So I, I, I believe this is the first of many times for us connecting, yeah. um, because I had, I got a coach in my life, uh, 17 years ago, 17 years ago. And just by doing what my coach said, my life could not stay the same. Right. And so I'm an advocate for it because it changed my life. Mm -hmm. And so now I do it for other people. Um, but when you ask what took me from welfare to a multi-million dollar company, 
I'm gonna tell you a couple of things and I'm gonna invite anyone listening to write this down. Please do not think you can remember all the details in such a way that you can feed them to yourself later and actually be in action about them. Number one, I decided in my life what had to become non-negotiable. Mm -hmm. So that was number one, is that there are some things that you would like, there are some things that you really, really want, and there are some things that are non-negotiable. And they're not all the same, and yet we put them all in the same category. Oh, New Year's resolutions. Oh, I want this. Oh, I'm going to do this. And you would say, I'm going to do this in six months. That still can be a want. Right. Non-negotiable looks different. As a matter of fact, Tiffany, you can't have a lot of non-negotiables at the same time. Yes. Like you can't have it in health and in fitness and in finance and mm -hmm. in uh, relationship and in money and in, you know, friends. You can't have a list of seven non-negotiables. Right. You would, you would be too intense. Yeah. You wouldn't have fun. So, so what I did is I made a short list of three things that was non-negotiable. When I was on welfare, I, I made a list of three things that was non-negotiable. And just based on where my mind was at the time, and a lot of people think like this, uh, some of your non-negotiables, you can unconsciously or consciously make it about what you won't do anymore. When in fact, the highest level of motivation and inspiration comes from something that's pulling you. Mm -hmm. But not all of us are running towards something. My first non-negotiable is I won't ever be there again. Mm -hmm. So I don't think there's anything wrong with that. You just got to know when you need to shift to something you yes. want to create. That's, a so great, my that's first, such a great point because yes. there's some people who are always running from something, but then you're looking back, <laughs> you're exactly. running back, you know, and then when you're exactly. running forward something, like you say, you're constantly looking forward. Looking forward. Yeah. And, and quite honestly, I think that when you're coming out of crap, I, I, there's no better way to say it. When you're coming out of mess and you come, I was coming out of chaos. Mm -hmm. you, you don't know anything other than but to look back. So right. all I kept saying is I don't ever want to be that broke again. Mm -hmm. So I went out and I made $72,000 and I was like, whoo, good. I don't ever want to be that broke again. Next year I made $183,000. I was mm -hmm. like, okay, good. I'm not broke. So for a long time, I grew my business trying to outrun broke. Right. <laughs> I just, but then I hit a cap. I hit a cap. For me, it was around half a million dollars. I hit a cap. I couldn't grow anymore because I knew I wasn't going to be broke anymore. Right. So when people plateau, Tiffany, when people plateau and they don't know, why am I not breaking the ceiling? Why am I not, why am I hovering in the space? Because the thing that you were afraid that would happen before, you already know it's not happening anymore. You took care of that. But you haven't turned around and you haven't created a really big, bright beacon light that you know is attainable. And the reason why I say you know it's attainable, because sometimes we will set a beacon light that we wish for, we won't even know if that's attainable though. So you don't have a lot of more, you, you are inspired by it, but you, ain't, you don't know what to do every day for it. Right. <coughs> I have to say, so when you were, when you were explaining that, like at first you, the thought that you wanted to delete from your head was like, I'm not going to be broke. Okay. But your language around moving away from being broke. And then the, the belief system, okay. The belief system changed because it is very interesting what you said, how when you set up your belief system based on not being broke and then you weren't broke anymore, then what? <laughs> literally, powerful what literally you and you don't even know that you ran out of gas. Right. You yes. just your heart, your hard run is over. Right. Now you try. So then, so then, what do you do then? How do you replace that limiting <laughs> belief of like being broke? How do you replace it and start, you know, re-engaging with yourself towards something? Well, to, well, for me, a big practice of eliminating a limiting belief is. I parallel it to the legal system mm -hmm. and the judicial system. In that, the judicial system uses this thing that is more powerful than anything else in the ju judicial system, and that is evidence. <clears throat> mm. And when, when, when someone's on trial, the first thing the judge says, oh, you say they're not guilty? Show me evidence. Mm -hmm. You say they're guilty? Show me evidence. And so evidence is strong enough to convict our lack of evidence, our evidence is strong enough to convict an innocent man and to let a guilty man run walk free.
That's how powerful evidence is. Mm -hmm. So I said, in managing my limiting beliefs, this is like, this is the skill, the, the tool I use. In managing my limiting beliefs, I'm gonna use the same thing that our judicial system uses, which is evidence, the body of evidence. Mm -hmm. So when I think I can't do something, I'm gonna go collect body of evidence that proves that I can, or body of evidence that proves that I can. Mm -hmm. Like literally, I treat my conversations as if it's on trial. Like, okay, so Lisa, you said, I, 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 and listen, I'm a, I'm a handful, so I have to tell <laughs> And I, I have been managing me for a while, so people are fascinated on how I, how I manage Lisa, how I keep myself going. And so I go, okay, you said that you couldn't grow up, uh, you couldn't grow, let's say, I never thought I'd get to a multi-million dollar company. I was like, I'm not gonna do that, I, I can't do that. And then I said, well, how did I get from 72 to 180, whatever? How did I get from 183? Well, if I can't do that, how did I do that? There's evidence to show I can double a company. Yeah. So I might not be able to take myself from three to a million, but if I took myself from three to six, six to nine, and nine, I already have evidence that I could do that. Yeah. So my agreement with myself was this, the moment I have evidence that negates the lie that I'm telling myself, then I simply have to go, then how do I make the truth show up in my life? Right. Very different statement. And so same thing when I said, you know what? I don't feel like I'm gonna ever have a love that is like long-term and it's this and that. And then I went back, kid you not, I went back and I interviewed three ex-boyfriends. Wow, okay, I'm all the tears. <laughs> I interviewed three ex-boyfriends and I asked them, what, what about me made it easy to be with me? And what about me, what ab about me made it difficult to choose me long-term? Uh -huh. Oh my God, this is powerful. What happened? Right. <laughs> well, they, once, once they found out that they were safe to give me the, and the truth, because you got to make it emotionally safe. Right. I mean, no triggers, no baiting and hooking them. And, and all of a sudden, we're, they're in this, this experience that they, they really don't want to be in. But it's just a dignified conversation. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I said is I want to engage in a dignified conversation mm -hmm. that celebrates you and me. And, and I just want to get some feedback. I, and you're a really great person to hold up a mirror for me. Right. I'm ready for long term term love and I want to get prepared for that and so my evidence in my past can help prepare me for my future and you're a part of my past what did you and learn? you know so it was something. right and they were just what like did okay. what did you learn <laughs> I learned um the part that made and, and this was so I ended up interviewing five guys because I've been I'm 53 I've been single for all my adult life so mm -hmm. I, I've, I've had some dating experiences and it was a universal, um, it was the universal point. What was lovable about me was the light that emanates from me, yeah. um, my positive attitude, my love for family, um, my loyalty to people, you know, my ability to just be loyal and my non judgment mm -hmm. So those, what made it difficult to choose me. And, what, and it was crazy hearing it because I heard it across the board. What made it difficult to choose me was my constant steepness in personal development made it awkward for them to be in my space if they didn't want to do personal development. Wow. What made it difficult to be with me is that the light, the public light that shined on me would eventually hit them and they didn't sign up to be in the light. Right. The third, <laughs> oh, this might be for you. I don't know, I'm not sure if you might. <laughs> the, th the third, um, was uh, that they didn't know if they wanted to be with a woman um, who uh, out earned them, out traveled them, uh, and out public them. Like they just, and, and they were very, very transparent. They're like, look, it might just be a dude thing, but you know, the concept is a, a wife kisses her husband as he goes away to work and he comes right. back. It's not a dude kissing her woman and she getting on the 747 <laughs> and coming home. So uh, they gave me that feedback. Uh, and then the last bit of feedback um, that they gave me was that <clears throat> from three of the five, I didn't know if I could be your Stedman. Uh-huh. 
You know, I had a whole different thing that I want to talk about with you, but this is so, this is so prevalent and this is such a, to this conversation right now, I think is showing up as so many women are stepping up into their greatness. This is a really significant conversation. Yeah. So I want to go back to point one, because I always tell, you know, my clients that your life is going to be defined by the five people that you spend the most time around. And if your mate, if you're a personal development coach, yep. and if your mate is not interested in developing personally, how do you reconcile that? Like, yes. you know, so when you heard that information, what did you say to yourself? Like, I need to be <clears throat> like, am I gonna back down? Or am I gonna look for another type of mate? How did you reconcile that? So first I sat with it. You know, because as doers and producers, we always want to do something with what we have. Mm -hmm. And the season that I'm in with all my experience and all my work on self and all my watching people grow around me <clears throat> and growing my, my personal life was, I want to master being with me as well. Mm -hmm. So I've mastered my doing. I can do with the best of them. Yeah. But I want to learn how to be with. Yeah. I want to learn to be with me, be with the information. So my the gap between my learning and applying is very short. Mm -hmm. Learn and do, <laughs> right? Right. And so <clears throat> I'm in this spirit in this space now of let me take it in, be with it, look at it 360. Don't be in a rush. And then ask God, and how do I implement, how do I live forward like I know that? So for a while, I sat with it for probably six months. Eight months, didn't tell anybody, just sat with it. Just gave myself the gift of stillness inside this information. And, <clears throat> and then I wrote each of them a thank you letter. Mm -hmm. And I said, thank you for letting me see a piece of myself, the part of me that you, um, uh, that you experienced. Um, I didn't have to agree with any of it. I didn't have to, it wasn't about complimenting me. It wasn't about putting me down. It wasn't, I literally for the first time could just take the information as if I were reading a book and grateful for the information. I, I realized I rose above all the personal and all the, I, I rose above that. I was right. like, thank you. Thank you for giving me the, the feedback that I asked for and the mirror that I asked for. And then I noticed that at least 70% of it was due to who I am in the world. Right. Right. Um, and so I then realized, um, I've been saying, and you've probably heard me say, your conviction and your convenience don't live on the same block. Right. I've said that when I spoke. And so then I begin, the first thing I begin to do, Tiffany, is mm -hmm. feed back to myself everything that I've said to get someone emotionally back in the game. I said it to myself uh -huh. um, in terms of love, because I wanted love and I wanted to be ready for love, but I needed to understand what love looked like with me. Mm -hmm. What does love look like with me? I only know my perspective of what love looks like with me. What does love, what does it look like to love a woman like me? Mm -hmm. And one of my former relationships, who's a good friend now, um, he said, we, I just opened up a, a dialogue with him and he said, he said, being with you isn't easy. He said, you're not high maintenance. Mm -hmm. You are cool, you low maintenance, you that ride or die chick. But being with you isn't easy. He said, when I was attracted to you, I was attracted to a beautiful chocolate woman who danced well, who's laughter. He said, but when I got with you, I had to look at my greatest fears, my greatest challenges and my insecurities. I said, I didn't require you to do that. He goes, no, but you do it. So you're so introspective. You, you're looking at all your darkness, all your bright. You look at your light and your darkness, and I'm in your proximity. So whether I ever say it out loud or not, I am I am forced to see my light and my dark because I'm in proximity with you. Oh my God, it was such a gift. I was like, what? And so, um, so how I begin to operate differently um, is, that in my next, which I think probably, you no, know, I had one relationship before for the one that I'm in. Um, I sat down and I just became much more transparent 
not in a way of giving him notice, but I, um, in the sense of an awareness, I, I'm aware that being with me um, sometimes requires people to look at part. I, I just discovered, I had discovery conversations with him. Right. And with my partner now, who who I'm not engaged yet, but we're 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 already at, we you know this will be my my husband my yes. husband will be. <laughs> um, we just sat and talked, and I said, I said, if you share with me what you think will be the challenges of being with you, I'll share with you what I think will be the challenges of being with me. I said, and let's not choose the easy part, let's choose the challenging part, mm-hmm. or let's discuss them. So we spent three days just discussing what we thought might be hard for the other person to digest. Right. And and it, it, we didn't have to do anything with it. We just got to see it. We just, I, I almost feel like like you're sitting on my coffee table now, right? I felt like we just kept pulling out, you know, all, pulling things out of our, our pockets. Right. And put them on the coffee table. Like, and this is my, and we just sat with it. And, um, and then I shared my fear around that thing and my fear around that thing. And I just exposed my fear. I, I, I'm afraid that when the spotlight's on you, because the spotlight's not on him yet, like no right. one knows about it, right? Yeah. When the spotlight's on you, that you may not want to choose that. And don't say anything, just sit with it. Let's right. figure out how to do it. So it wasn't, so instead of reacting, we, de- we designed, I used everything that the, that beautiful feedback gave me and I put it on the coffee table with him. Mm-hmm. And I said, here's what my feedback that I got. Mm-hmm. And I some of it he was like, What I want to say though, but what did he say about the spotlight? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, he's the sports news anchor here in the Bahamas. <laughs> so he's got his own spotlight. Okay. And that's kind of what he said. He's like, baby, I got my own spotlight. Like, what? He, but I, I didn't think of that. I didn't think. Um, but then when I told, he's not a, um, he's quiet, very quiet, very shy. Um, and uh, part of my life is I do mastery retreats. Right. So I do mastery retreats for speakers. I do mastery retreats for powerful women, um, uh, gladiator women, right? Mastery retreats. And a part of the mastery, and I do them here in the Bahamas. Mm-hmm. And a part of the mastery retreat is to come to my house. Right. And he's very private. Yeah. And part of the feedback I got was when so this is what one um, my former boyfriend said, when I date you, I'm dating an entourage. <laughs> and I'm dating a lot of people. And I thought, wow, because I love it. I love people right. around me. I don't think about it. He's right. like, I didn't sign up. I didn't sign up for all these people, everybody. Right. <laughs> and, so, and so that was great feedback. So right. he and I talked, and he said, um, when we move together, I just need a man cave. Mm-hmm. And I need to be excused to my man cave, and I don't have to come out. And so literally right above this room, right here, is this about, about where it is? Yeah. It's over there. Uh, we are building a man cave, and if I could put a door to it from the outside so he never had to come out, I would give him, you know. So it's really important though, because I have the same issue with my husband. I think when there's so much light, you know, and they might, you know, even though he's amazing in his own right, like just all the light, all the activity, they want to go to that cave. They don't, they don't choose all of that all the time. So I, mean, I, chose, I chose you. Yes, yes. Okay, so right above your house, you're saying you've got a whole cave getting set up for him? Yes. Well, one of the things I had to realize was um, being nice and being kind uh, are wonderful, but there's this whole other experience. Mm -hmm. We've grown up hearing, do unto others as you want them to do unto you. Mm -hmm. Treat others as you want them to treat you. And to me, the evolved awareness of that is don't treat others the way you want them to treat you. Treat others the way they want to be treated. Yes, oh <laughs> like, my God. That's, there, this is a perfect <laughs> example of a limiting belief. The limiting belief, do us do us yes. let's see what happens, do unto you. And people get love, they accept and receive love differently. They need different yes. things that you need. So this is beautiful, yes. you need to expound on that. That's, that is yes. exactly why so, I'm interviewing you. Right. <laughs> right. 
don't do unto others as you want them to do. Do unto others as they need done unto them. Yeah. So, so that's the exploration that I, I get, I've gotten to be in, and I'm encouraging women and men who, who want to be in these healthy relationships, even sibling relationships, parental relationships, familiar yeah. relationships, friendship relationships, and romantic relationships to go, how do you get loved? And so I have a book. I don't have it right around here. It's upstairs. But I have a book, and in the book, it's dated January 18th. I did it on the 18th of January, 2020. And it says Lisa Nichols on the left side, January 18th, 2020 on the right side. And the title is What Love, what love Looks Like to Me. Mm -hmm. And I just started writing down things. I didn't do fast. Every day I'd come up with, oh, love looks like, oh, yes. making me a meal. Oh, love looks like, hey, saying I was thinking about you. Love looks like sending me a bitmoji. So, so I kid you not, my beautiful partner didn't do any bitmojis, didn't do any, didn't do any of that stuff. And so I said to him, loving me looks like sending me random bitmojis. While we were in this interview, uh -huh. while we're in this interview, I just get, now this is not him typically, but because I'm, I'm sharing with him what love looks like to me, he just randomly sends me this. Oh, oh, oh I love it. And he says, hey baby, <laughs> I oh, love you. That's so nice. So, but, and, and, but, but that only came because I realized that love is an open book test. Yes. And so oftentimes we have the book closed and we expect, because he's a grown adult, because she's a grown adult, figure out how to love me. You should know better. How would I know what you consider loving you looks like? So I realized I need to open the book and I need to get, and I need to read the book. Don't just open a book. Read the book. Read the book out loud in such a way where it can be, where it can be palatable and digested. And then ask, what's in your book yeah. may i read your book would you read your book to me and so that's that evolved level and so i take share the answers share the answers don't keep them guessing <laughs> share the answers yeah. and i also realize when he does something or she does something that that touches your list say baby <laughs> You yes. touched my list. You oh touched my, my list. That's on my list. Kills. Yes. <laughs> Listen, and so will he. Yes. And so will she, right? And so my big thing is I'm always letting him know when he touched my list. Mm -hmm. Because when people want to make you happy, especially men, they're like, just tell me what I need to do to ring the bell. Right. Just tell me what I need to do to ring the bell. Don't right. make me guess. Tell me. And so um, it was really great to hear the feedback from the gentleman that I had dated previously. They all wished me well. Um, I asked each of them if there, if there was one piece of advice that you would give me, what would that piece of advice be? Uh -huh. And here was the advice. One gentleman who's a neurosurgeon, pretty amazing man, he said, um, the advice that I would give you um, is to uh, let him know how much you miss him when you're gone. Cause I don't do that. I'm yes. not, I'm, I'm, oh my God. I, let him know how much you miss him when you're gone. It might feel like you might feel like you're being clingy to you, but it doesn't come across as clingy to us. Um, because you're going, you're living large. You're out living large. You know that you miss us. That was number one. The second thing um, that I asked, what, what advice would you give me? And one gentleman said, um, he said, I can't financially supersede you. You, 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 you so far out there. He said, but tell me the things that I can do for you that you can't do for you. Like, mm -hmm. tell me the ways that I can be your superhero. Yes. You know, the, the word that resonates with men more than any other word is hero. Right. And what happens it is- It fills their testosterone. Yes. What happens is when we are doers, okay, we can get more education and get a better job and get a good career and do this and do that and do that, then we don't leave any space. I always tell my clients, like a guy wants to ride up on his horse, put you on it and carry you off into the sunset. But right now what happens, he rides up on his horse and you're on your <laughs> horse and you guys are like <laughs> on the horses, you looking at each other and you looking at each other horse to horse and he gets to talk, he's like, go ahead. <laughs> 
He's just right. trying to get you on the horse, you know, so he right. can be your hero. And that, because we've changed as women, like we're not the traditional roles, then right. how, what that hero looks like changes. Right. We haven't stopped to address right. that. Which right, I'm you, the hero. How do you, how do you reconcile the fact when, because we all want to be successful, but when you're making so much more money than the eligible men out there or whatever, how do you? Well, how first of all, that? first of all, um, I don't, so I don't put money on the table as a, um, as a measuring factor because mm -hmm. money is not the commodity that I adorn. Mm -hmm. I recognize money as an instrument and a tool. And I tell people this, money is a tool, money is a team member, money is dirty paper, money money is not the end all, money is the comma, money gives me access to better memories. Right. I'm very clear, I'm very, I'm very clear on the tool and the team member that money is to me. So, so that being said, it's still a factor because, um, you know, I have a lifestyle and when I date someone and, and then dating my partner, though he's a he he's his status here on island it's very different between the island and san diego right know, very different and so i made it very clear what i needed in my life and i didn't say here's what i need that you can give me i just said here's what i need i let him self-select that he can give it to me what i didn't say was i need financial stability and i need a man to make as much as i make i didn't i, I didn't even bring the money up in my need list Mm -hmm. So when I said, here's what I need, I said, I need, I, I would really love to have a man who was his word. Like your word yes. means something to you. It means something to you. You don't keep your word for me because of me. You keep your word to me because of you. Right. Right. I need someone that would allow me to be a super sister soldier hero and vulnerable, scared and needing to be held in the same second. Mm -hmm. That one doesn't diminish the other. I, I would like a man who was fluid and flexible, meaning you allow me to be a hermit when I don't want to step out the house. You will allow me to be on the stage in front of 13,000 on the day that it needs to occur. And neither one of those calculates who I am in totality. They're just a part of me. Mm -hmm. um, so I just shared with him the things that I, at my core wanted and needed. And I said, and you opt in or opt out, you determine. And so when he came back and said, what about finances? Right. I said, I need you to be able to fund your dream. Mm -hmm. That was it. What does that mean? That if you have a dream, you fund it. I'm not gonna fund it, you fund it. Yes, okay. Like, and if you can fund your, as long as you can fund your dream, I'm fine. I don't need you to fund my dream. I don't need you, I need you to fund your dream. Right. And so if you have a dream, I don't even care if you don't have the money, figure out how to fund it. And right. as long as you can do that. And so when he asked me the same question, well, what does that mean? That means that that your finances will be in the equation of us if we go far enough. But I'm not making my decision to be with you based on that. Right. But how but the question is, so yeah, his dream, say his dream, you know, has X amount of dollars every year, and your dream has X, X, X amount of dollars. How, I mean, like, how does how do you handle? How does he feel about that? Because a lot of men do traditionally feel like their role as a man is to be able right. to provide for their woman, to take care right. of them. And some men even say like they feel uncomfortable with you living above the needs that they can provide. Right. How do you so, that? so, so that's been a big issue for me, uh, quite honestly, in past relationships. Um, it it it's come up. Um, and it's all it's never brought up by me i think for for a long time tiffany i wanted to downplay my earnings mm -hmm. you know um and i remember saying about three years ago four years ago maybe i said man i thought that people wanted women to do well now i've done so well now they're saying the reason why we can't be <laughs> like, well, like I'm, I'm i'm confused where i was supposed to stop somewhere <laughs> like you never told the hunter to stop hunting right, right. <laughs> and so um so I've had, I've definitely had both parts of that. Mm -hmm. And what I realized is that when, uh, when a man had an issue with our earnings, our difference in earnings, uh, it was bigger than that. And, um, and, and that was one, one facet. It normally came down to self-worth. And mm -hmm. at this, the topic of this conversation 
their limiting beliefs said that they couldn't be 100% of the man that I, need, I, I needed and I wanted in my life with their current income. Mm-hmm. Uh, different, than, dif- different than my opinion, because I very rarely track it. With, the, with my partner now, um, I put it out there. Mm-hmm. I didn't put out the dollar amount that I made because I, I, I'd never done that before. And when we knew we were serious and we wanted to go all out, he put out his dollar amount um, and he was far more comfortable. It's funny, he was far more comfortable with his limiting dollar amount than I was with my significant dollar amount. Yeah. Which was crazy. He said, look, this is what it is for me. And I take care of all my own needs and I can continue to do that. But just so you know, this is, and I make my, and then he said, and I make my decisions from this budget. Right. Right. And so um, I said, so I, I 10X you. What do you think about that? He goes, how will that come up in our relationship? He goes, you, you've never thrown money up in my face. He said, and as long as it doesn't become something that we use as a tool against each other, I'm okay. And so we just made that agreement. And so then I said, when we travel Mm -hmm. and our lifestyle, um, here's the caliber that I'm used to, and let's decide how we make that dance. And he said, okay. And so we just talked about it all. We just, I I, I didn't want to dumb down. I didn't want to shift. I didn't want to, and yeah I, we you know we eat differently you know um he eats differently now that i'm here and mm-hmm. um every now and then i'll say go do whatever that other food is you normally do today that's your that's your out day right and then come back here and so we just literally just kept talking about the dance there i don't want to date my twin that's yes exactly so i don't need it to be exactly equal or more i don't i don't want to date my twin Right. You know, um, what's come with his um, life is more simplicity than mine. So right. I'm going after that. Right. You know, um, and so uh, I've, I've, I, what I do realize is that we're not, we don't live in an either or world. You don't get to be successful or in madly in love. You don't get to, you don't, you don't have to choose an either or. That's, mm-hmm. that's a misnomer. Mm-hmm. And our limiting belief from our childhood yeah. and our parents saying, you can have this or that. Right. <laughs> You can't have both. You can have yeah. that. Converse, and the truth is, no, I can go a little deeper and structure this so that I live in abundance mm-hmm. and I can have both. And that's my job. So to me, the limiting thinking is from a place of scarcity and lack mm-hmm. uh, and competition at times. And when we move to wait, there's more than enough. The limiting thinking, uh, we're, we go after our off of our mother and our fathers. And what I often tell people, with all due respect to your grandmother. Right. Because your grandmother did it that way does not mean she wanted her grandchildren to do it that way. Yes. You know, and when I say that to people, they're like, ah, I said, bless your grandmother, honor your grandmother's life by evolving. Right. Because a lot of times it's true. Like I had a really breakthrough moment when I realized that my grandmother because I mean, there was also there's also some guilt around being successful. You know, there's guilt around it and the money. You know, and then so I realized, like, wait a minute, like my grandmother and my mother struggled and suffered, so I wouldn't have to. So the struggle and the suffer doesn't have to equate itself with love. Stop. You know what I mean? Don't perpetuate it. Don't perpetuate it. Don't perpetuate it. it. But when but we, we have that, you have you have in progress. Yes, we do that because it's what we know. Like, I struggled for you, or I had to walk 10 miles for school. Those stories that everybody says. And then we want to pass that on to our children. Why? Which, Why? Well, be- because we are, I once read a study how um, African Americans are 88% more likely to buy something because it was created by an African American. Mm-hmm. So we're highly loyal to our culture. Mm. Um, and our culture has embedded in it our spirituality and don't touch our spirituality. Right. And so there's this, there's this idea that we're not being, we're not being committed to the culture. And I can tell you firsthand when, when I finished my first two, um, chicken soup books, chicken soup for the African American soul, chicken soup for the African American woman soul. And I was steeped in black people, black people everywhere. <laughs> because of the books. Then my next book was The Secret. Uh-huh. And everything turned very, very different. Right, it expanded. 
Right. It expanded, but I didn't feel any guilt until it expanded. Mm -hmm. As I felt like I was continuing the work of Dr. Martin Luther King, continuing the work of Nelson Mandela, continuing the work. I was, we the people going to have a better life. And all of a sudden, right. dare I to get a better life. <laughs> and then you I, almost get separated from the cause, right? <laughs> you listen, get separated from I, the cause. Listen, I was at, I used, I, my cousins and I are very close. And we would go to my cousin's house and we would all laugh, sit and laugh. We're in our 20s and our 30s. And we'd laugh about how we had to rob Peter to pay Paul. And girl, I applied for a credit card. And the lady looked at me like I was, and girl, I gave my credit card and they broke out the scissors. We had all these bonding experiences right. around bad credit, around struggle, around robbing Bobby. Peter to pay Paul. And I remember the first time I went to my cousin's house and everyone's laughing and talking. I'm just sitting there silent because I can pay Peter, I can pay Paul, I had a credit card, I didn't need to get credit. Like there, but to me, what it felt like was alienation. Right. To me, it felt like I didn't have this in common anymore and I was losing my bond. Mm -hmm. So when you ask, why do you want to keep doing that thing over? It's because that's our connection. Yes. And that's our, that those are our ropes, those are our, our, our three cords. And so I remember feeling I remember the first year I made I made nine hundred, like nine hundred and and sixty thousand dollars or something, in, in October by October nine sixty nine seventy five, and I stopped working for the rest of the year. You didn't want to break that. I told my, huh? You didn't want to break the million. It was scary or what? I didn't know that though. I told myself I needed time off. Uh huh. In the next year, it was a really good year. We hit 983, 985 by August. And I told myself again, Tiffany. Wow. I want to take the rest of the year off. And I could feel it in my bones that I was lying. Right. And so I had to sit with, why would you? And, and it took me a while. I didn't come up with it as fast as you just came with it, but I was like, mm -hmm. I'm afraid you're afraid to make a million in one year. Yeah. And boy, when that came out, I was like, whoa, I didn't even know I had that limiting belief back there that if I made a million dollars in one year, then I have to move over to this, this group called the wealthy. And right. that group is spiritually bankrupt. Their children, right. are, their children are dysfunctional. Yes. They're greedy. Uh, they, oh, don't yeah. care about, they don't care about grassroots. Like I had this list. I didn't realize that I was unconsciously feeding myself this list of limiting beliefs. And every time I got into the 900s, it made me slow down. Yes. And so I went back and I did personal development and I yes. started working on the limiting beliefs, which is why in my latest book, Abundance Now, I got a whole category on finances and, and your money blueprint. Yes, well, I'm gonna be getting that book. And so I wanna also tell you that like, because you touched on two things that I want to kind of rope in here before we finish up. Um, because what you were saying about the camaraderie that you have and the struggle with your family, and I've noticed you've also had a very significant transformation in your body image and health. Yeah. And what happens sometimes when you start getting in shape and you start eating better and working out, people will start telling you, oh, you look sick. Oh, you're too skinny. Ooh, you know, your people want, like, if they're kind of happy for you, but not really. So I have a lot of people that I coach with it. When they start losing weight, they almost start feeling isolated from their old habits, their old friends, their old bonding. So, and then, so how does that play a role for you? Like, by really transforming your body, like, in, how did that affect your life? How did that affect your relationships? And how did you stick to it without falling back? Um, so I got to my health transformation through, uh, I would call it a unique journey. Um, I wasn't just a hundred pounds overweight from, uh, poor eating and poor lifestyle. I had been an athlete for 13 years. I was a state champion, um, in track. I, I held the 330 low, low hurdle records at my high school record at my high school for 18 years. Mm -hmm. Um, so I had a very prolific, um, uh, athletic background and who I am as an athlete at my core. Um, and then I went through this window of severe, severe health challenges that no one knew about. They were very, very private. 
Um, and I, I had a 28 day menstrual cycle for almost 10 years. And my hemoglobin level, my hemoglobin level, which should be a, a 13 to 15 count, what averaged a six to seven and a half count because I lost so much blood. So my heart rate was very, very slow and I had no metabolism. So my doctor put it this way once. He said, Lisa, you can eat broccoli all the time and gain one pound a year because your metabolism is non-existent because you don't have enough blood in your body circulating at any given time. So all the energy is just trying to get your blood through your heart and back through your body without you having a heart attack. I ended up having six blood transfusions in three years. Oh my God. So when you would see me on stage, what you didn't see, the second half of that story, was that I would leave stage, finish speaking, sign autographs, take pictures, get in the car, and someone would drive me to urgent care and I would have a blood transfusion. Wow. And so in the Lisa Nichols life story, you may see that part, you know, because I'm finally ready to tell that. Um, but, um, and because of the significant um, uh, blood loss, which led to the um, really slow metabolism, um, it led, it then kicked into sleep apnea. Mm. And um, the average person with severe sleep apnea wakes up 30 times an hour. And my first sleep apnea study said that I woke up 62 times an hour. And so I was dealing with sleep apnea and obesity and this um, hormonal challenge, which wasn't endometriosis, it wasn't, it wasn't um, thyroids, it wasn't, it was undetectable. They had no idea what it was. It's just off. We just, we don't know how to stop the bleed. Like I, it was horrific. All the while traveling over 210 days out the year, building a multi-million dollar business. Okay, but stop right there because this is, I need to know this. I need to know this. As you were suffering all these health challenges, okay, you were bleeding 28 days out of the month, you were overweight. What was it that still put you on that stage? What was it that made you keep going instead of giving up? Um, first of all, quitting was never an option. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I took, remember I started this conversation with there's a distinction between what you like, what you want, and what's non-negotiable. Yes. I started with that. Oh my God. See, I'd already put, I'd already put inspiring others as non-negotiable. Yes. So it wasn't, am I gonna climb over whatever's on its way to me? It, it, it wasn't that, am I gonna climb over it? It was, simply, what is it gonna take to climb over it? And so I had no idea when I decided that in 1997, I remember when I made the decision that it was non-negotiable, Tiffany, I remember. I had no idea that in 2000, 2001, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, for the next 10 years that I would spend in and out of hospitals, I would spend on gurneys and emergency like it was the norm. I had no idea. But what I knew was that I was gonna be inspiring people. That was right. the one thing I knew. That's <laughs> the one thing I knew. I made it non-negotiable. I, I tell people, you, it's not what you want, it's not what you like, it's what's non-negotiable that's gonna matter. And so I never questioned quitting, never. Never once. I just kept asking God, how am I gonna finish going? How am I gonna finish going? <laughs> so, so what did you do? What, what, is, what happened? What did you, did they find out what the cure was? What did you do? <laughs> no, there wasn't. Um, so <laughs> yeah, some endings end. They don't necessarily happily ever after. They end and then you make it work. So what you see now is me making what I call my health hell work. But there was never any, oh, Lisa, it's this. And now you're cute, nothing. Um, it ended with um, my medical doctor calling me, requiring that I get on a Zoom with her mm -hmm. so I could see her face mm -hmm. when she told me, "You are, though you carry it well because you were a former athlete, you are now officially morbidly obese. You are 224 pounds. You wake up 32 to, uh, 62 times an hour. Mm -hmm. You have full-blown sleep apnea. You are a uh, driving risk, a health risk. She said, I'm telling you, you are. it's not about if you will have a heart attack. She said, 
you have all these health challenges and you travel over 220 days out of the year and when other people go to work they go to their computers when you go to work you get on stage in front of thousands and yeah. you motivate them so you're taking the little bit of energy you have and you're pushing in and giving it away right. she said it's not a matter of if you'll have a heart attack it's a matter of when will you have a heart attack and bigger question where will you be and this is what she said looking at my face like i'm looking at yours Will you be on stage when you have your heart attack? Will you be in the, in, in the hotel by yourself? Will you be at home with your son? Um, or will you be, she says somewhere, hotel, stage, at home, or office or something. And she said, you need a major, major intervention. She said, you have the, the, the cross that is, that's very far and few between that very few people have, whereas your, your low hemoglobin has, you have no metabolism. No metabolism, slow to no metabolism, has you have no energy to work out and you cannot ever burn fat. Your body's holding on to everything mm. because you're slowly bleeding to death. Your mind thinks, your body thinks you're slowly bleeding to death. Wow. So it's gonna hold on to everything. Broccoli will, will, will stay on you. She said, and cross with that, severe sleep apnea. You're never rested enough. She said, so the idea that you're going to get up the energy to go work out, to keep doing it, is unheard of. You need a jump start. You need 50 pounds off immediately so you can get some sleep. And you need to hold on to your blood. You need to stop needing blood transfusions. Do you believe my stubbornness for two years after she said that I still didn't get anything done? Wow. And then one day I was in a hotel and I envisioned my death. And um, I called and she said, I, I, ha I had been on my cycle 62 days at that point, nonstop. And she said, come in, you need a hysterectomy. We just have to, we have to, if we, if we can't find what it is, we have to stop the boot. So I had a hysterectomy. I got my hemoglobin back up and, and um, not really up, it took, took five years. Mm -hmm. um, um, she said, um, and you need to have a gastric bypass. Mm -hmm. And I resisted another because my ego wouldn't allow me. Mm -hmm. And she said, you still will do the fitness. You still will do the work. You just have to be willing to have that jump start. And so um, my path there was long and hard. Um, I didn't just lose weight just to be fit and small. I, I, mine was a health intervention so that I can see my son's children be born. Yes, yes. You know what I say about those things too, is that, you know, there's that whole adage, I think, you know, Michael Beckwith talked about it once when he was, um, he was needing help and um, he almost drowned. And, and he realized that when you need help, God sends you the help, okay? But if you keep looking the other way for the help to come from who knows where, you're gonna miss it. So- Or you keep saying no, your ego. You keep no, saying no, you. your ego. But like if that, got you, look where you got. You know, from right. the fact that someone created that for a reason. You know yeah. what I mean? For a reason. Yeah. Because my ego, when I move my ego out the way, mm -hmm. and I made the phone call to the gastric bypass doctor, Mm -hmm. They looked at my hemoglobin level. They looked at my sleep apnea and what normally takes six months and many, many tests to get approved for. I was on the table in 32 days. That's how wow. severe, that's how in danger I was. And wow. so, um, so my health journey has been tumultuous and, uh, I, I am 2020 and beyond. I will do more health advocacy than people have ever seen. Wow. Um, and I believe that I can come at it from a very holistic way because I was, I built my entire brand obese. Yes. So I didn't wait to lose weight to live. That's the whole thing. I wanted to, you know, so your body image, okay? And because a lot of things that I talk about is body image. So some people let their body image, whether they like it or they don't <laughs> like it, prevent them from doing what they're meant to do in their life because they can't get past that I don't like the way I look, I don't like the way I feel, I mean, it just changes. So what did you tell yourself? Did you just love yourself along the way? Or was your no. mission greater than your limitations? That, that, I said, 
If I waited till my body image was where I wanted to be, shame on me. Yeah. Then the th that calling on your life is not just for you to, to answer the call and to get the, and receive the message. The calling on your life is for people to receive something from you. Mm -hmm. And so I dare me, I dare not deprive people of what God has in me to give to them because I'm waiting to right. lose weight. How selfish, right. how about me it is. And so I was always clear on that. I was always clear on this is my journey. This body is my journey. The reason why I released the weight was because in my prayer time in, in 2014, I asked God in November 2014, I said, God, for the next level of calling on my life, what could I do to get in the way? Mm -hmm. I asked really juicy questions to God. Mm -hmm. What can I do to get in the way? Why, why, what can I, what, what, what will happen to prevent it? And God said to me, spoke in my spirit, you won't lose the weight and your body won't be able to live out your life's purpose. Wow. And so what I am very committed to is the calling on my life. Mm -hmm. And, and I didn't want my ego, mm -hmm. my self-sabotage mm -hmm. to interfere with the calling on my life. Yes. And so when I got that, when I got that, you're not only not losing weight, it's so what you can travel the world with this extra weight on you. So what you can drop it like it's hot and stay there for a little bit with the extra weight on you. Mm -hmm. You cannot live the calling out. And so when that, you know, can you be obedient to even to the degree of getting back from the table, working out, making better choices. I launched the in my sexy back campaign. Oh, I got that. So your mission was greater than your limitation. Yes, and 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 I wanted to I want to get to the end of my life and say I played full out. Mm -hmm. Like we have one job, have no regrets. Yes, and 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 you actually can completely influence that. Like when you really get that, stuff's gonna happen. Stuff's yeah. gonna happen with, with finances. With but you have one job. Now, I'm not saying you have one job, make it all work out perfectly. Mm -hmm. Have no regrets, which means touch your 100. Yes. Yes. Touch, oh my God, you're giving me chills today. Touch your, <laughs> touch 100. your 100. Yes. Touch your 100. And whatever happens, happens, but at least touch your touch 100. It. Touch it. Don't be afraid of it. Don't be no. afraid of the reach, no matter what it takes. Let me tell you, that image of you, being on stage with that health opportunity is going to stay with me and motivate me because no matter what, the mission is greater than your limitation. It's yes. greater. So I thank yes. you. For that. I thank you for giving that not only to me, but to everyone who's out there, whoever is afraid about touching that 100, you know? Yes. Using and options. I got to tell you something. I'm sorry. I, got, I just have to share this with you. 10 years ago, I took a picture of a woman doing a plank on the beach mm -hmm. and she had on a crop top and i knew at 224 pounds you never get me in a crop top you know the the the, the workout top with some leggings and she was suspending herself and she looked like just a, a pillar of power a pillar of fitness a pillar of possibility and she was brown she looked like me yes and i just she seemed so distant, so distant. I couldn't, Tiffany, I couldn't visualize me. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't see me there at all. Mm -hmm. I, I, have, I haven't been living here 30, 40 days yet. And the first five days I was here, I went to the beach. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my God, I love it. I love it. You're so phenomenal. You're so phenomenal. And I had to earn the right to take that picture. That picture isn't easy. It's not just a snapshot. Mm -hmm. That was climbing over. That was becoming non-negotiable. Yeah. That was giving myself, that was giving myself a thousand second chances. Yes. That was confronting my own limiting beliefs, confronting my smallness. That was running toward the woman I was becoming versus trying to outrun my past. Right. So, 
You are so powerful. You're so powerful. Thank you so much. Like I said, I could talk to you forever, <laughs> but since we do have a time, time is at our knocking at our door right now. We're going to wrap this up, but I want to tell you one story that motivates me and I use it to motivate everyone else. Um, you told me, I was watching one of your episodes when you were on Oprah and behind the scenes, she asked you, you know, if you had a coach, you said, yes, I have a coach. And you asked her how many, does she have a coach? And she said something like, I have three coaches. You know, do you remember that? And you said, I do. you know what I did after the show? What did you do? <laughs> I went and got three coaches. Got three coaches. <laughs> so listen, this, when you told me that, and you know, a lot of times we have blind spots in our lives. Sometimes we have blind spots. We can't really see not only our limitations sometimes, but our possibilities. And that's why it's so important to have a coach. That's why it's so important to see somebody that can bring out the best in you and yes. help you push through. So you're doing that service for the world. You're doing that service for the world. You're being that brown girl up there who did it that we can look to and say, if she can, I can too, you know? Amen. So your mission being greater is inspiring people, all kinds, all shades of people, women in general, men too, with your new message. So I look forward to your new book. Thank you for all this wonderful inspiration that you had. Thank, Thank you for being an inspiration in my life because I am going to be in that journey with you of lifting people up to release that self-doubt, to get over those limiting beliefs and start to create the life. Create the life by reaching for that 100. Yes. yes. Well, I, I appreciate you. I appreciate you for being a stand for um, fitness in this season, um, there, 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 there aren't enough sisters mm -hmm. of color of any warm hue. Um, that is a total stand for it, and and that's not my mission in that way. The way you're doing it is my mission to to align with you, mm -hmm. um, to add my energy to your brilliance, and um, for us to lift up. Um, a world, not a nation, but a world of women and men, so that health becomes the wealth. Health yeah. is the health is the currency. That's health right. is the currency. It's that currency that's priceless. Um, and so I'm going to make a bold request of you since yeah. we've had yeah. so much time together. Okay. <laughs> so I'm doing this crazy challenge called snatching your sexy back. Uh -huh. um, it's called snatching my sexy back. It's free. It's just. Uh -huh. It's just. I don't want to do it alone. Okay. I want to come out the closet of training by myself and trying to get it right. And so for several months up until the first weekend in May, so for several months, we're just holding each other accountable. We're celebrating each other and we're getting on a call every Saturday and um, for 45 minutes and we're, we're, we're doing two things. We're celebrating ourselves for what, for what we did the last seven days around our health. Mm -hmm. And then we're making seven days of intention. Yeah. So we're just taking seven days at a time. So I'm going to ask you if you would be willing to be, uh, you're the only person I've asked uh -huh. um, to be my guest trainer with the towel. I want to know about this towel thing. Yes. Like, hey. <laughs> so if I can gather the tribe, would you be our guest trainer on Zoom? And can we come live? We'll come at a time that works for you. And you give us the towel. I tell everybody, just bring the towel, whatever else you have. And we all, me included, we just, we, we learn and we grow and we share and we, would you be willing? I would be honored. I would be honored. Hey, you make the call. I am there. <laughs> Whatever it Good. is to be your Ray, I would be honored to do that, to bring this workout to you. So we can all be on the beach in our crop tops doing the plan yes. one day. We can all reset 100. In the Bahamas. Yeah. Come to the, in the Bahamas. Bahamas. Yes. So consider the challenge accepted. Okay. Yes. And from there, I'm going to say thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa, for inspiring me, for inspiring the world, and for bringing your brilliance. Your Thank brilliance, you. okay, to the big stage, bringing your brilliance to the little ones, bringing your brilliance to all the ones who are becoming the woman to reach that 100. So Thank you. you're an extraordinary human. I mean, I've been looking forward to this interview. You exceeded my expectations. So I just wanna say thank you and you guys, Follow her, Lisa Nichols, Motivating the Masses. Get the new book, Abundance Now. Join her in the Snatch Your Sexy Back. Let's make it happen together because my motto is, we are better together. Yes, All we right. are. Signing right. out. Thank you so much, Lisa.
Thank you. Be well. Bye. Bye bye. Oh, that was an amazing interview. So listen, if you guys want to keep talking about this, I want you to join me on the after the show. Okay, so that's an after the show chat where you write me at getfit, G-E-T-F-I-T at T-R-F-C dot club. And you could be one of those selected to participate in the after the show video. If you have questions, if you have things that you want to talk about, if you just want to chit chat, get something off your chest, this is the time to do it after the show. Please write in, and I can't wait to hear from you. Okay, so remember, as always, on the Insecure Cure, our goal is to delete self-doubt, replace limiting beliefs, and create the life that we want. I'll see you next time.